Hey all, welcome to Challenge Accepted. I am Frank and I'm here with Thomas. Aloha everybody. Today we are talking X-Men uh, episode six and this is the second part of Life Death. What'd you think of this episode? Yeah, I'm glad you said six because in my notes I wrote five and I'm like, <laughs> this wasn't five. So I'm happy you said that. Uh, this episode was uh, definitely a come down, I think from yeah, the last episode. Fair. Yeah, there was a lot of great stuff that was established. Uh, a main character came back in a lot of ways. And a lot of interesting ha things happened to Storm in this episode, which I appreciated. Um, but it didn't have the emotional weight for me that episode five did. Still still loved it, though. There was a moment towards the end, the Xavier reveal, that was... Um it hit me pretty good. I will say like, oh man, that's, you know, more confirmation of something I didn't want to happen. But yeah. other than that, yeah, it was kind of par for the course. We expected it. Also, yeah, Storm realizing who she is was really cool. And uh, that new suit, I'm not hating. So that was pretty, I mean, it's oh the old God. suit, but yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, I know what you're saying. But that classic suit just looks yeah. so good in this episode. Oh, yeah. Let's break this episode down because I want to go beat by beat in this, uh, fire, in this one. Fire away. All right, so in the opening sequence, we get the classic song, of course, but we also see that Nightcrawler is added and there's a Nimrod thing. I want to talk about that later. Um, mm -hmm. Deathbird then attacks Ronin the Accuser and the Kree. We also see that the Imperial Guard are there um, and we get to see uh, the Gladiator. Um, from there, we go with Alondra is announcing her marriage to Professor X to the entire Shi'ar Empire. Uh, we get... Storm back with Forge. The, the adversary is still there. She's the adversary is kind of that devil on her shoulder and really trying to fight, yeah. put a lot of doubt in her, mm -hmm. right? And and just kind of bring her down. Um, Forge says that there's a magical flyer that can heal him. Um, Deathbird then is kind of insulting Professor X as well back in the Shi'ar Empire. So it's kind of cutting in between these two it different is, yeah. stories going on. Um, Storm then finds her in her power. Um, she regains it. Then Storm sh uh, shoots up to the stratosphere. She gets her classic costume. Professor X then sees that Gambit and a bunch of mutants have passed away in the astral plane, which is heart wrenching. We have some time. You have so time? much time. We yeah, have, no, I'm no. almost done. Okay. So uh, yeah, then he feels guilty about leaving the X Men, basically having to forego this challenge that Deathbird gives to him about forgetting everything from his past, including the X Men. He realizes that he can't. He's left them behind. He's left mutant kind behind, and has to go back to Earth to reunite with the X Men. Um, and in the final sequence, we see that Gyric is running away from Sinister. There's a lot of hints here as to what happened on Genosha, and I still think that there's somebody in charge beyond on Sinister, but we'll discuss that more. Um, and that's kind of it for the episode. You still have more time left, but you did great. Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't think I did, but I think I hit the high points. <laughs> you hit you hit a lot of the important points, and I know where you're going with the uh yeah, the apocalypse of it all. So let's let's split this into two. Let's go with uh let's go to the she uh she are no. first. Yes. I keep I keep saying she ra <laughs> My bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, this is later than we normally record, so it is. Yeah, we quite is. the day. <laughs> so we got Conan the accuser. Conan, see, Mike, Ronan the accuser. I told you I'm not going to edit this damn episode. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed that mistake. <laughs> yeah. We had Ronan the accuser in this, a little bit of an MCU tie-in, which, of course, he's a part of all of Marvel. But I was like, oh, hey, <laughs> we, we know him. Don't, okay, so thank you for bringing that up because I was like, man, I felt so much MCU in this episode more than any ep episode that we've gotten so far. You're right. We got Ronan the Accuser that we saw in Guardians of the Galaxy 1. We see the Kree there. We've gotten a lot of Kree lately, whether it's been in Captain Marvel or in Guardians of the Galaxy. Um, that has been a big deal. We also got it in Miss Marvel too. Um, yeah. But also later on, the way that Forge uses his power looks a lot like Doctor Strange to me. It does, yes. It's it's not Doctor Strange, but I do want to talk about how his power, how his mutant ability and magic works together. I think that's mm -hmm. interesting. I don't know how that works, but I think it's something there. Yeah, I, I I can explain it to you. I think I have a good understanding of it, but it also like I, that power. I I wonder if they made it look like it to say that this this power is pulling from the same place Doctor Strange pulls his power from. I took it because he mentions his grandmother or mother later on uh, to be something of his native people, like the desert type of thing. So I thought maybe, you know, I thought maybe it was pulled from there. 
True, but if you if you look at the MCU Doctor Strange one, there's the library where we first meet Wong, and he protects all of the magical books that don't just come from one culture. They come from cultures around the world. Maybe okay. that his grandma's book would be considered one of those cultures where that magic would stem from and also be tied to that force. I don't yeah. know. It just it felt like too. It looks too close. I, I we'll post it on our threads, Instagram, whatever. Mm-hmm. But I have a side by side picture going on from Doctor Strange doing it and Forge. It looks very damn similar. So let's 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 look into that more. How does Forge's power work with magic? Um, so you're right. In the comics, it comes from his heritage and this. It's kind of sorcery, really, yeah. but um, yeah, it's tied to more of his Native American heritage. But there's not really, as far as I know, not a deeper explanation beyond that. It's like he has ties to mystical powers that comes from his, again, Native American heritage. And so that allows him to tap into it. But he kind of pushes it away because he realizes his mutant gifts in science can kind of achieve everything that his magic can do. And also he kind okay. of wants to push it away. I kind of thought like his mutant abilities make him different. At, like he can look at a spell book and see like, this is how you perform this spell. So I can forge this up. Basically. I kind of felt like maybe uh, it was a combination of the two. That's pretty cool. I've never thought about it in that way. Um, I, yeah, I, I've just never thought about it that way. Like I just didn't occur to me, but it's wouldn't he the- see basically a blueprint and then manufacture what he saw in that blueprint. Like a spell book would tell you this, is how you perform that spell. So he would then yeah. make that happen. He would create that spell. That's true. You're right. I, again, I have not thought about it that way. <laughs> but but from what I remember, from what I remember in Forge's story, he also tries to push that away. There's something okay, about so it that, there. yeah, there's something about it that um, kind of brings back some old memories that is kind of traumatic for him or, mm-hmm. th- yeah, that, that it doesn't, you know, it's just some past trauma there. And I think... Oh, this is what it was. So when he goes to Vietnam, he he does a spell uh, basically that allows him to survive. um, But I think it kills everybody else or everybody else is not saved by it. So he has trauma linked to his magic. And that's why once he comes back, obviously he has his robotic arm uh, or his hand and leg. But also he's like, I'm not going to use that because it's just it brings up too many dark memories from that incident. That makes complete sense. As somebody who doesn't know Forge, Forge to that degree, that's what I was piecing together. I like what you're saying there. Um, yeah. I want to also mention that the fact that he uses it in a, an emergency situation to save Storm shows that he was kind of getting past his fears. And the adversary's entire thing is feeding off fear. So it was kind of him breaking the adversary in two senses. So, so well said. Yep. I, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. Yeah. Uh, well, let's stick with Storm. Then we're already on that side, so that, I think that's cool. Uh, yeah, he gets. You know, we know that he's gotten bitten by the adversary, and it's just poison, the spell, whatever curse that's going through him. Unfortunately, they have to go to this deep cave. He's going to be tagging along, um, and they get into the cave. We have that cramped space, and I love how that's a good reference to some deep, even old school, uh, you know, X Men animation series mm-hmm. of of Storm. How she's afraid of a, a tight spaces, claustrophobia. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, yes. Yeah. She, she and myself share that. Wow, I'm having oh, trouble okay. speaking. <laughs> but yeah, I, I share that same thing. I am so claustrophobic. And I love how they bring it up. I mean, the adversary in this whole episode is just the devil on her shoulder with this. Mm-hmm. And there's no angel. She has to become her own angel. And it's it's saying all of her worst fears. It's gaslighting her. You know, you you never wanted the power. You know, you were never good enough. You couldn't be the leader. She uh, puts her then in the box in a coffin. She's like, let me out. I can't breathe. Oh, my God. That part. I hate it. I hate it. That's my that's my worst fear. Um, So me and Storm share that in common. (laughs) And uh, yeah, so there's so much of her inner strength that has to come through and her belief in herself to overcome the adversary when, which, when she finally does, it almost also overcomes her own fears and gives her the power. I just, I love the the metaphor here. So help me out with this. Is adversary a physical form creature or is it only a representation of their fear and trauma? Yeah, I I think I think it's like a metaphysical creature. Like it's not necessarily like it doesn't have a body, but from what I remember 
reading up on in the comics, it was like um, th- like a spirit entity that's created from uh, uh, Forge's like worst uh, fears and okay. and pain and all that stuff. So when he banishes it away and it still appears, especially in the cave, it's when she drops the light and then all of a sudden she gets claustrophobic. That's when he appears. It's I assumed it's because she's essentially summoning him with her fear. They make it seem like he's almost a predator hunting prey and the prey is their fear. Like they bring it on yeah. because of that. But also kind of like you brought it. It's something it's your fear you're facing immediately. Yeah. And I think I can't remember. I got to look up exactly from Forge's past, but I know it's something with his because he uses his powers. It also forms the adversary. And you're right. I think then the adversary then feeds again, like to what you were saying, on their fears, on their depression, on their doubt, that kind of stuff. And we see it happen here. It just so happens in this show to be attacking Storm the most. And yeah, yeah, I I love it. It just kind of works so well, because in the in the comics, I think it's I don't know if it's Storm that beats the adversary. I kind of forget, but it's more just trying to attack uh, Forge. Okay. Yeah, this yeah. makes sense because they're trying to... Well, let me let me ask you this. Uh, in the comics, is it Storm's mental b- block that's forcing her to not have powers? Or is it more so the Executioner's weapon? Yeah, because I, I think if, if, if I recall correctly in Life, Death, Part 2, which was a ton of books later, I don't know why yeah. they did that, but... Um, I'm pretty sure Forge says like, oh, the gun that I shot you or Gyra sh- shot you with didn't completely take away your powers. It only um, stopped it for a little bit. And so he creates like an anti device that reverses it. So that's what I was kind of hoping was that it was a little bit of column A and little column B. Like she goes into the anti device. Oh, it didn't work, but you've gone through the device. And then later on, we find out that it's a mental break because I don't to me, it feels like Forge didn't help her a whole bunch then. Right. And in this show, it doesn't seem like he does. But I think you, right. you called it out in one of our earlier episodes. You were like, oh, I think that she was actually flying. And then when she wakes up, she yeah. kind of comes crashing down. And I agree even more so after watching this episode, because yeah. I think she was, you know, accidentally summoning this power. She does it again in one in this episode. Right. At some point, she kind of flies up and, and falls down when she thinks she doesn't have powers. Um, maybe when she was put in the, the box. But yeah, I think she wasn't able to tap into it. And, and in this story, she has a lot more agency on gaining her powers back. It's, it's her finding her inner power. It's her believing in herself. It's her finding her inner strength. And then we get the sick shot of her like flying out of the cave and so, like oh. into space. We get like a I, satellite. It's so cool, man. Dude, that part was so sick. I was like, man, she went all the way up to space to like yeah. transform. And I, I, you know, I thought for a second, I was like, how does she get a new costume? But I was like, you know what? Don't even go there. You don't, don't even, need to. Yeah. This is awesome. It's <laughs> yeah. just Storm doing Storm. Doing. It's one of my favorite shots from Superman movies is when they do that. Like he goes and then he goes like supersonic and he see that little next boom out of Superman. And then whenever yeah. you see him go through clouds and clouds trail off of him. It's one of my favorite shots. It's in the comic books too, but movies always pull it off. And Storm yeah. just did it in this one. I was like, oh, that's a cool shot. Right there. It was, yeah, totally. But in space, like they, they made a point to show the satellite first to yeah, show like yeah. she's not in like the normal sphere that we're in. She's like in the full stratosphere. And yeah, that's just so cool. Cool. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think this is a, a big moment for Storm. I'm happy she got her powers back. Again, it's a little bit different than the comics, but I, I see why they did it this way. It makes a ton of sense. Again, it gives all the, the strength back to her in finding her power. Do you think that she is now elevated to another tier? Like she's stronger than she was before him? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. If this show has told us anything about this phase of X-Men you know, the animated series or cartoon, you know, 97, it's that everybody has another tier that we haven't seen yet. Episode one, it was Cyclops. Episode two, I can't really remember. I don't remember, but we got Jubilee's next tier. We We know that there's another tier coming up for our boy with the bow staff. Yeah, Um, exactly. Gambit. I mean, Gambit taking down the whole wild Sentinel pretty much by himself, even though, you know, he had to sacrifice himself. He blew up that whole thing by himself. So there's, yeah, I, I think she's at a whole nother tier and we saw her training to become super Saiyan four or whatever, yeah. you know? It, yeah. Gear five yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. And I love how her suit changed again to the classic look, but a very much like telling this is who I am now. And even when she's talking now, she's got her hairs like long and flowing. It's a whole different mm-hmm. look now. It's, 
it's very much that she upgraded, she leveled up, and um, I can't wait to see her. I mean, she at that very much point does not know about Genosha, but then she sees Genosha, she sees the upset, and she's off to go be an X-Men again. Like, I, there's no doubt in my mind. Probably Forge is going to join her because we keep getting Forge in the yeah. uh, tr- uh, intro. I Hopefully he'll be, he'll be there too. Yeah, I, I think you will kind of join the main team after this, which is going to be awesome, and they can explore that relationship even more. I, I think... Again, seeing what we saw in the last episode, I, I think Cyclops starts losing his grip on being the yeah. the boy spat the boy sc- scout. scout. <laughs> it boy is spout. eleven o'clock at night for us guys. Just a reminder. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, but um, yeah, I, I think he loses his grip on it, and so because yeah. of that, it creates this perfect way that storm can come in and be the leader and i'm yeah. so for that I, I i think this series is perfectly following that chris claremont period and if you follow how those books went this is very much the way it's going god one of these days when i have a staff of people i'm gonna start a podcast where i go into the life and times of comic book greats and claremont's yeah. on there hickman's on there we're talking about hickman yeah i think yesterday yeah yeah, yeah. It's amazing what he, to me. Whenever I think of Claremont, I think of the the brown Wolverine suit. That's kind of my signature. Like that's Claremont, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, and there's so much uh, defined in this period about uh, these characters, even f- beyond what uh, beyond what Stan Lee and Jack Kirby did. Like they gave them another dimension too. They yeah. became more human, like you know, and everybody's personality sh- shined through. I-, I told you, I was like, I read life death. And then I was like, wait, what happened before this? And then I went like 20 issues back and started reading from yeah. there. And you really get to see who Wolverine is and who Nightcrawler is and who, uh, Colossus is like, I, I hope we get Colossus by the end of this season. That'd but, be nice, yeah. Yeah. I'm, but, I'm just happy we got Nightwing in the intro now. Like that's... Oh, Nightcrawler, yeah, Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler. In the intro now, like that is really cool because him with the two swords, oh man, it brings me back to like the pirate days. That's cool. Yes, yeah. that was so sick. Um, I, I'm glad you brought up the intro. Okay, we, we briefly mentioned this at the start. Um, just to bring it full circle, there's a couple things that I also mm-hmm. noticed. We also get a, a nod to Nimrod. And yes. we see in episode one, we see the master mold Gyrix there. Um, and that also brings up all the other little Sentinels that they have to fight. Well, Nimrod is an advanced version of the Sentinel. Nimrod's whole deal is that he's so advanced, he can adapt to any situation and thus find a way to beat it. So he basically, all the X-Men, he finds a way to like, you know, kind of evolve past their powers. It's like yeah. humanity's answers to it. So Nimrod's a giant villain and they just like out of nowhere just slid him in in the title sequence so i was like that is going to be something and they fought him in the original series as well the first season Mm -hmm. and uh do you think he'll be an introduction to bastion at all yes so thank you for bringing it up uh the online consensus it could go so many different ways right at the end of this episode that we're talking about we see that sinister references genosha but if you yeah. look at episode five, a lot of people believe that Bastion was there because you can see the top of his head. And mm-hmm. also in Life, Death, Part One, Forge has a picture with him, a scientist. And then there's a yeah. guy that very much looks like Bastion, but his face is cut off in the picture. Yeah. So, yeah, well, I, I think it could be. So, I, you know, we, we were I think we were both thinking it might be someone else leading everything, but there might be somebody else. You know, um, do you think Sinister is fully in control of this or do you think he's just a puppet of soft puppet yeah yeah i i think he's the next boss up but we haven't seen the boss above of him i it yeah. is either going to be bastion or i'm still not out on cassandra nova like i still think 100 yeah. percent cassandra nova could have been messing with sinister to then get gyrix or um trask's dna to create the wild sentinels or control the sentinels yeah uh yeah uh, uh going back to the intro real quick uh we have a different voice for previously on. It's always kind of whoever's important in that episode. It was mm-hmm. Storm's voice for the previously on in this one. And then Ooh, good catch. Yeah. And then the Marvel logo, did you notice the heartbeat or drum sound? But I, I think it's heartbeat um, that was going on during the, which to me felt like Gambit barely alive. Oh, it's, dude, I didn't, I didn't catch that at all. After that's, this, check it out. I mean, it's right at the beginning when it's doing the, it's just a dum 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 Like it was a heartbeat, but it was like real slow. What? That's so sick. Okay, I gotta I gotta check out for that. We also get to see the Imperial Guard. And little side note there, um, yeah. we get to see the third Summers brother, Vulcan. 
Yeah, dude. And that dude is strong. <laughs> so strong. Oh, yeah. He's an Omega level mutant. And they yeah. didn't even reference him. They didn't say his name in it. Just chill. They, yeah. They didn't even address him. Like, you, he just pops up in the title sequence and in that first fight with Deathbird, uh, Gladiator, and then the rest of the Imperial Guard. He's just there. But they don't even... I was like, whoa, that's Vulcan. They didn't even say anything. Like, yeah, crazy. That's crazy. I'm so glad they brought in the Gladiator, though, because if you're a 90s kid like me, you might not know, and I didn't really know anything about the Gladiator, but I definitely had that action figure. I don't know how. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. we all had the Gladiator action figures. Totally. I couldn't tell you a damn thing about them, but yeah, I always had him fighting Superman. <laughs> you know? right, right. Yeah. Like, I probably thought he was a wrestler, too. You know what I mean? Like, Could have been, yeah. such that 90s wrestler look with that, like, yeah. mohawk in his head, in a sense. Yeah. Like, it's so weird. And the cape. But he's got Superman power. He's just a weird, he's a weird character, but like, yeah, everybody had that action figure as a bad guy. He he was dope though. Every time he fought on this thing was very much like a Kryptonian, basically. Yeah, you're, like we're saying, enter mm -hmm. the room. And it was just stopped right in front of you to to fight death. It was a Deathhawk? God, why well, can't I think names Deathbird. Right now? Deathbird. Oh boy. When he just like <laughs> Deathbird, who is amazing fighter, and he just like stands in the way of Deathbird, stands in the way of these bullets, stands in the way like, oh man, Gladiator's showing off a little bit. Yeah, that's cool. I know. He's sick. He's such a cool character, and I like when the X-Men have to fight him, and they can go, you know, it takes all of them to t to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him, which is crazy. But speaking of Deathbird, there's a one part in the beginning, too, where we see her throw Ronan and the Accuser on the ground, and she steps on him, and like, basically, like, punctures his face with her heel. Yeah, I was like, that's a pretty savage move because we know how strong Ronan the Accuser is from Guardians of the Galaxy 1. Like, he was right. unstoppable. They couldn't beat him. He got yeah, he held one of the Infinity him. Stones just fine with everybody else, yeah. Yeah, and that's why it's like, shows how powerful she is and how, yeah. how powerful the Shi'ar Empire is, which we haven't even got in the MCU yet. So... I That's really want be. them to be because I really love their whole bit. The fact that they're mm -hmm. avian descendants and like they have feathers instead of hair. And I just and they're like they're war hungry conquerors like all the rest of them are. But a lot of yeah. times we ally with them, you know, and just like we do with the Kree sometimes and the scroll sometimes. But totally. yeah, I, I like their whole their whole vibe. It's cool. Yeah, they're they're almost like a evil Starfleet. Because it's also a yeah. mixture of like a bunch of different aliens to put in there. Mm -hmm. And then the Imperial Guard is like the best of the best from the different alien classes. So it is interesting. And we get to see a lot more of their politics. One, um, bringing Professor in, X in. Um, before we get into the marriage talk, how did you feel about that introduction? So a couple things, actually. Um, you know, that the helmet, I think if you're not familiar with seeing it already in the comic books, you think it's a little bit off-putting. Um, and they definitely made sure you were aware that it's the machinery that's walking him because they made sure that sound was a little high. And yeah. I felt like he he played a little younger than Professor X actually is. Did you get that at all? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing for me, there is an adjustment in, in this Professor X, but I think the biggest thing for me was like, ah, oh, it's a little anticlimactic because the whole oh, great was, point. Yeah, absolutely. You know, everybody was speculating, what happened to Professor X? Did he die? Yeah. When is he going to come back? And then he, you know, Lalandra just basically does this report to the rest of the Shi'ar. I was like, I'm marrying this dude. And then he, he just comes walking out. I mean, he takes off the helmet. But it was just like, really? It wasn't even the start of the episode. You yeah, know, it was I like after all this cool says stuff happened. Professor X beforehand. So if she hadn't said that and he walks in and reveals himself without being called out, that might have been more of a surprise. Yeah, well, she says, like, we've had a Terran who um, has been with us for a year and, like, I've fallen in love with him. And it's like, that can only be one character. Okay, because yeah, yeah. In the last episode, that she must have been what it him. is. Yeah, because yeah, I, was, I was like, so oh, it's Professor obvious. X. It's because I knew right. that part was coming up. So maybe I wonder if there's people who didn't know what Professor X was doing. Maybe they were really like, whoa, you know. Right. It just, yeah, for me, it was, I just wish he was introduced in a different way. That was yeah. really, I don't know what other way you could have done it, but it was just like, okay, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was the only side. But he says a lot of amazing things to her in this episode talking yes. and she's trying to teach him about Shi'ar culture and he's trying to tell her there's people I just miss back in earth and I don't know how to, to, bring both of these concepts together. Like the people I love and miss from earth, my X-Men, but also like, you know, I love you and I want to be a part of this culture. How do we make this work? Yeah. I, 
I, he is amazing. And, and uh, Professor X, when he's part of the show, part of X-Men, it is true X-Men. I, I, that's just the way it is. And um, I will say that his uh, mannerisms, the way he spoke, it was almost a little bit more adversary than I think normal. Again, a little bit more younger. But once mm-hmm. he pulled off that helmet and started doing his mutant powers and brought them into the classroom, that I felt right into it. That felt like Professor X to me fully. Yeah. Yeah, the classroom scene too was just like, oh man, I yeah, just show it off, you know. Yeah. Like he's like, I forgot my true power, and brings them all in, makes them students in the class, and starts mm-hmm. showing him, not telling them what the rules were, not you know, not uh, writing it on the chalkboard. Like this is the rules, you must follow it now. I'm the yeah. teacher, and that whole scene is just so damn good. Yeah, and he explains imperialism and and everything like that and how, like, basically, this is what you guys are doing. It's what we've done. It's what every culture that has any success does. They stop on the ones that don't have success. Like, he's breaking it down like he would as a professor to his students. And it's like he's he's doing it to the queen and the leaders of the She-Ra Empire. I just – it's just great. Uh, She-Ra Empire. Oh, boy, there it is again. Um, Yeah. (laughs) It was good. But then we have the turn in that thing, which that's the moment I was like, oh, man. Yeah, before we get there, though. I want, yeah, I want to address it because you brought it up. This, uh, there was one of the lines where he, you, in the imperialism side, um, mm-hmm. he goes, oh, you know, it's the fallacy of like, for us to be more, you must be less. And that yeah. line just hit me so hard. You know, it's like so many people think for you to be greater, I think, I think the internet's a great example. Is like you have to bring somebody else down so that you look better. I know. And I just love that call out. Like that line, I, I that's post worthy for me. Like just that, yeah. line, you know, that that scene. So that's a yeah, great sorry about point. that. Let me write that down real quick because that is post worthy. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, honestly, Professor X for president, if I'm being honest, right? <laughs> he, he I mean, for it. me, yeah, for sure. That's exactly it, though, is is the fact that you don't need to uh, press down on anybody else. And I feel like for a lot of people that might be. Not known. And we see it with everybody that's protesting, the Friends of Humanity and stuff like that. They think that they have to stomp down on the mutants to make themselves stronger. That's not how it works. If you go, if you work together, you could be Professor X's idealistic future. I do like when him and Gladiator are talking and uh, Gladiator is like, oh, you and your idealistic ways or whatever. You know, he's like, I've got an old, old friend back on Earth that thinks, to, thinks a lot like you or whatever it is. Oh, it's yeah. so cool. I know it is cool. Like they, they really are best friends and Magneto, you know, like other people have tried to be his friend too, but he, something about just, he respects Charles. He did, they have this deep love. Yeah. And maybe it's just that too, respect for each yeah. other. And it's like, oh man, it could be a year. It could be thousands of millions of miles in a galaxy far, far away. And he's still like that. That's my best friend right there. I love it so much. Yeah. Um, me too. All right. Now let's get to the turn. Where yes. he sees that suddenly the globe spinning bursts in pink energy, like Gambit's abilities. He sees uh, um, all these she are are dead, and then you know in his vision, um, then a uh, the giant Gambit shows up. Uh, he turns into a skeleton, and then he gets blasted by the wild uh, Sentinel's green laser, and is in shock. He knows what happened at that point. I think he's kind of seeing that. Gambit has died and there are more to come with like the whole uh, multiple dead bodies in the room kind of thing. What did you think about that? Oh man. Yeah. That hits so hard. I love that. Gambit is the one too. Like, yeah, I, I feel like Gambit is such a, a underrated or he's always like second fiddle to a lot of other characters in the X-Men, but he's so pivotal this season and I just love it. And I like I'm how sure he's one of those characters that's just, I have, of course I do, but he's just generally like liked by everyone. There's nobody that's like Cy- Cyclops, while I think is getting a lot of redemption, has yeah. been always one of those characters that's been a little bit hot and cold for some people, especially with totally. how, you know, and, and so, but I think Cyclops, or I think uh, Gambit's just a safe bet that everybody likes, Cy- you know, Jean Grey, people will argue that she's, you know, cries a little bit too much during battles. It's always right. been that joke, the <gasps> meme. Faints somewhere, I, yeah, yeah. that's how. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, but, but everybody loves some Gambit. Yeah, I went back and watched some old episodes from the animated series, and it was a Gene heavy episode. And my wife's like, "What is she doing? Like, she's just having an orgasm like all over this episode." And I'm like, that, "She's fainting, okay? okay yeah, get yeah, your mind together." But yeah. <laughs> she does sound she does sound like that. And uh, yeah, you're right. Like Gambit's always looked cool. He's always had swag. He's always had this demeanor and powers. And I just love that he's becoming an emotional uh, pillar in this team as well. And it hits 
Professor X so hard that again, uh, thousands, millions of miles away, he still feels like, oh my gosh, I lost him. But then all of these souls, these minds, um, you know, the, that essence of these mutants, it, it all hits Professor X. And it shows how powerful Professor X too. Like normally he would need Cerebro on Earth and now he can feel them, you know, again through the galaxy. So that, that also kind of struck me, but yeah, this was a good reason to get Professor X back to Earth. Do we see him taking the armor with him? Um, I don't think so. Yeah, I think he goes back to hover chair by the end of it. But I thought that was cool. Like, you know, it's a way to show how advanced the Shi'ar is. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's too iconic to have him in the chair. He has to go back yeah, to the chair, yeah. I think. Yeah, totally. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any final thoughts on this episode? Um... Not really. <laughs> I feel like, you know, we kind of touched on a lot of good points. I think we picked out all the really symbolic moments for this episode. You know, definitely a great Storm one, definitely a great Professor X one. Um, and I think, you know, this was much needed so that when we get the whole team back at the end of the season, we're like, all right, Professor X is in the team now. Storm is back. Like, everybody's yeah, back. I feel earned. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll throw out the fact that when uh, Storm returns to her powers, they gave her the same music as her intro after the Omega threat level detected scene from the first episode. It's sort of her. Damn, you've been finding the. You're finding the hot Easter eggs in this one. That's <laughs> that's a great call out. Well I posted done. that one immediately. I made sure to make that clip of those two. I didn't end up now listening to it. I'm like, oh, I didn't line the music up right. But it's the same <laughs> music for both. Yeah. That's the perfectionist in you. I'm sure everybody else was like, this guy's, yeah, I'm so sick. There's a like, bunch of people saying like, oh, I love the music in that scene. Like everybody's talking about that. But I'm over there like, nah, yeah. they're off by a couple bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's off by a millimeter. It's <laughs> off by a, yeah, it's off by one beat. It's so cool, oh, though. Man, it so just funny. shows it's it's her theme music. And frankly, it's amazing. It's such a good music. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And then I don't know. Is there anything else you feel about Sinister in this? Just to close it out. Sinister is great in, in that he's kind of just like your go to throw a bad guy in there. He's always cool. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I think that he's being puppeted by. We could have Cassandra. We could have Apocalypse. We could even have Nimrod having a I don't, I don't know. To me, Nimrod. I never really care for Nimrod, so I hope it's not Nimrod. I know that Nimrod's going to come up, though. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I like how Mr. Sinister is always kind of like that second fiddle to somebody or whatever. He's he's cool, though. He is. He's just got a cool design. And we know, again, in the MCU, he's probably going to be the main villain for the X-Men movie. So mm -hmm. if they do do it in a way where, you know, you build him up, build up some familiarity, but then we get Cassandra Nova, and then it's like Deadpool. Yeah. Man. So, Yeah. A lot still to be figured out, but, you know, solid episode. Yep, solid episode all around. Um, all right, guys, again, we're continuing A24 month all month long. Check out our social medias. We're posting A24 stuff, and uh, we just did some behind-the-scenes pictures from The Green Knight, and I just loved how it was like, oh, cool, medieval stuff, a pile of cameras behind everybody. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was yeah. pretty neat. Um, and then uh, we're going to be doing the rest of uh, X-Men every – we'll try to do them Wednesday. <laughs> all right, yes. guys, we'll see you then. All Bye. Right. Aloha.